Let us prepare our hearts for the reception of God's word proclaimed in prayer. Come, divine light, illumine our, our darkness. Come, great physician, heal our wounds. Come, Holy Spirit, flame of divine love. Burn up the thorns of our sin and kindle our hearts with the flame of your eternal love. In Christ our Lord. Amen. I have a, a collection at home of uh, old Calvin and Hobbes comic strips. When they stopped printing them, I stopped publishing them. I, I was able to get just the one or two of the, of the collections of, of the great comic strip. One day, little, little boy Calvin is asked by his teacher, Calvin, did you read the history assignment that I gave you? And he responds, I, I tried, Miss Wormwood, but the, the book publisher didn't use the, the proper print fixative. And, and when I picked up the book, all the letters slid off the pages and onto the floor. And as the precocious little Calvin approaches the principal's office, he says, you know, I think my excuses need to be a little less extemporaneous. <laughs> Making excuses is something it would seem most of us learn at a very early age. And in fact, have become quite proficient at, at offering them. And when it comes to the church, we can all find excuses for not attending a Bible study or a worship service in person, or, or online. We have handy excuses for not offering to serve or provide leadership when asked to do so. We can all find reasons, reasons for not fully supporting the, the church or for backing away from the commitments we've made when we joined the church, when we united with the, with the chapel family. But you know, this is nothing new. Young Jeremiah had an excuse ready when God called on him. He said, Lord, I'm just a boy. I'm not a speaker. I can't be your prophet right now. But God was prepared for Jeremiah. As God is always prepared for our human frailties, God said to Jeremiah, Don't say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Jeremiah, don't worry. I'm going with you. I'll deliver you. And I will give you the words to say. Well, think about this for just a moment. With that kind of ever-present support from God, is there an excuse that anyone can offer for not being a faithful and a committed disciple of Jesus Christ? God has such a, a marvelous plan for your life and mine, if only... We would let go and let God follow Christ in this world. I love how Kent Keith has expressed our call to Christ-like discipleship in his book, Jesus Did It Anyway. Keith writes, Jesus is not calling you to worldly success. He is calling you to serve God. He is calling you to be in the world, not of the world. He is calling you to love and to help people no matter what. He is calling you to reach out to those in need and make a difference now. You may have worldly riches or you may not, but you can always enjoy the richness of a life with God. You may have worldly power or you may not, but you can always enjoy the power of Christ. You may suffer or you may not, but you can always find deep happiness in Christ. You may fear, or you may not, but you can always find encouragement by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is calling you to a paradoxical life, to a life of discipleship and love in a world of self-gratification and self-service. And then Keith adds, Will you answer his call? 
You know, there's tremendous insight here. When life is tough, when we're pushed beyond our normal capabilities, beyond our, our normal capacities, if we can learn to rely on God, we'll discover all the resources we need to be faithful and obedient and productive. We'll, we'll discover that the more we need, the more we're able to find ourselves able to give. The more we turn to God, the more we'll discover God fulfilling our deepest needs and granting us joy, true joy. God doesn't overpower our will, but when we turn to God, God's marvelous plan for our lives begins to unfold right before us. Like Jeremiah, God will use us to further his kingdom and share the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. Indeed, how can we deny a loving and a generous God who promises us, as he did Jeremiah, to be with us, to support us, and to guide us at all times, in every situation, through every tough spot in which we find ourselves? You see, as the world sees it, one person alone is almost always helpless. And we fall to that line of thinking. But my friends, one person with the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit can make an impact upon our world, small and large. You and I, especially together and with God's help, can make a difference in this world today. I think it all comes down to the crucible of love. There's an old Hebrew tale of a rabbi who asked his students, how can we determine the hour of dawn when the night ends and the day begins? One student raised his hand and said, when from a distance you can distinguish between a dog and a sheep. Another said, when a person can distinguish between a fig tree and a grapevine. And on and on the explanations went until finally one student said, wise teacher, share with us the answer. And the rabbi said, when you can look into the face of another and have enough light in you to recognize them as your brother or sister. My friends, the church where people strive to love one another and the world as God does, demonstrates what it means to be the body of Jesus Christ in the world. And this being our, our charge, if not our challenge, let me ask you this morning, who is going to step forward? Who's going to step out and lead us? Who is going to demonstrate the presence and the power that can redeem us and, and our nation so confused, so misled, so much in, in trouble today. Who is going to deliver us? And not only our chapel, not only our community, but the entire Christian church in the world today, which is struggling. Yes, who's going to deliver us? Who is going to keep the body of Jesus Christ alive and well in our world today? Well, as the instructions go, take a moment and look to the person next to you. Take a good look at the people gathered in this sanctuary this morning. Look into their faces for some clue, some a glimmer of hope, because I tell you, the Messiah, the Lord, is here. A story from The Different Drum by Scott Peck might help us to understand, if not create a new paradigm for being the church. It's entitled, The Rabbi's Gift, and it tells of a monastery that had fallen upon really tough times in Europe. 
It was once a great order. But now there were only five monks left. Only five monks. And they were quite elderly. There was the abbot and four others, all of whom were in their late 80s and mid-90s. Clearly, it was a struggling order with no, no hope or not much hope for the future. They were a dying order. One day, as the abbot agonized over, over the intimate death of his order, it occurred to him to go and visit the hermitage that was very near this monastery and ask the rabbi who would visit there often for rest and, and for reflection. Well, the rabbi welcomed, welcomed the abbot, invited him to come in. But when the abbot explained the purpose of his visit, the rabbi could only really commiserate with him. He said, I, I know how it is. The spirit has really gone out of all the people. I have to tell you, very few people come to the synagogue anymore. Well, the rabbi and the abbot wept together. They read their respective scriptures even shared some back and forth. And they spoke quietly, deep things. When it came time for the abbot to leave, they, they embraced one another. It's wonderful that we should meet after all these years, said the abbot. But I've still failed in my, in my purpose for coming. Is there anything at all that you can tell me, any advice that you can give me that might possibly help Save our dying order. I'm so sorry, the rabbi said. There's nothing I can, I can tell you. But this, I had this passing thought as we spent this time together. The Messiah is among you. When the abbot returned to the monastery, his fellow monks gathered around him to ask what the rabbi had to say. Well, he couldn't help, was the response. The only thing he did say as I was leaving was that the Messiah is among us. It was cryptic, kind. I don't know what he meant. Well, when the days and weeks and months had followed, the, the old monks pondered the significance of the rabbi's words. Could he have possibly meant that, that one of the monks, one of the five old men at the monastery was, was the Messiah, was the Lord? And if he did, which one? And the abbot, the stoic but wise old abbot? Oh, yes, if, if he meant anyone, certainly it was the, it was the abbot. He'd been their elected leader for more than a generation. Surely he was the one. But on the other hand, he might have meant Brother Thomas. Oh, certainly, Brother Thomas is a gentle and a, and a holy man. Everyone knows that Thomas is a righteous and a, and a holy man. <laughs> he certainly couldn't. He could not have possibly meant... Brother Elred, <laughs> Elred's a little crotchety at times, you know. Certainly couldn't have meant him. But you know, even though he is a thorn, a thorn in our lives from time to time, when you look back, Elred was almost always right. In fact, they couldn't remember a time when he was wrong. Oh, no! <laughs> Maybe he meant Brother Elred. And on and on, they contemplated in this, in this manner. The old monks, as they contemplated, began to treat each other differently. They always treated one another with, with respect, but now with even more awe and respect. And the off chance, the off chance that one among them 
might be the Messiah, the Lord. Now, because the monastery was tucked away in a beautiful forest in Europe, townspeople often came to, to visit, to picnic on, on the grounds, or to wander along its, its beautiful green paths. And every now and then, to even meditate and pray in its dilapidated chapel. As they did, some of the people began to sense this new spirit. This new spirit of love and, and, and respect that seemed to surround and radiate from these five elderly men. These very special monks. There was something compelling about it. Hardly knowing why, the people began to return more frequently. They returned to the fre more frequently to the monastery to picnic and to play and to pray. They also brought their friends to show them this very special place and to introduce them to these very special, special monks. And their friends brought their friends. One day, out of the blue, a young man who had spent many days there in prayer asked if he might join their order. And then another, and another, and another. So that within just a few short years, the monastery was once again a thriving order. And thanks to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant and a dynamic center of light and that light, my friends, as I hope you know, was the light of Jesus Christ and the Christian faith. The Messiah is among you. You know, many look at the church today with great skepticism. And they wonder how we can over, ever overcome all the problems we face and all the bad press that we seem to receive. People say the church is full of hypocrites and that the, the church has gone down all the wrong paths or it moves far too slowly to address the world, to change the world for the good. And let's be honest. Sometimes, not always, sometimes they're right. What they fail to realize, and what we fail to realize sometimes, is that Christ is among us. The Holy Spirit that we can never ultimately comprehend or contain is alive and well in our midst. The Spirit that is patient and kind, never jealous, never boastful, never arrogant or rude. A living presence that never insists on its own way, but rejoices in what is right. A spirit that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. The spirit of the living Christ that lives and breathes and moves among us in his body in this place. It is the love of Christ living presence that helps us to see the Lord, or at least an angel unaware of which the Scripture alludes. Perhaps in the hungry person who needs compassion, or in the person who is sick and lonely, the, the person, even in our midst, that we can't remove from our thoughts until we have visited them and lifted them to God in prayer. Christ, my friends, is in the newcomer that we, that we seek in our community and welcome. In the person who is struggling that we greet, sometimes in our own narthex. Yes, in our narthex and out on the street. Yes, Christ. Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
is among us. How shall we greet him? How shall we treat him? And how shall we serve him this day? In Jesus' name, amen.